We've entitled it, Without Purity, We Cannot Please God. And uh, we started to read from Genesis 39. Now, he, uh, Mark did. And let me fit, pick up where he left off. It so happens that uh, Joseph was in charge of the entire household. And uh, so happens that uh, Potiphar was a very strong man as far as an Egyptian. And uh, he put Joseph, because of, he trusted him so much, that he put him as an in charge of his entire household. And so I'll pick up from there. Now Joseph was well built and a very handsome man. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, uh, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house except he owns what he has entrusted me to care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has held nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. One day, he went into the house to attend his duties, and none of the household service were inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, Come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. When she saw that, she had, that he had left his cloak in her hand, and had run out the house, she called her household service. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has brought to us to make sport of us. He came here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard this, the story, his wife told him, saying, this is how your sleep treated me, he burned with anger. And Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison ward. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all of those who held in the prison, and he was made responsible for what he had done. Whatever immaturities Joseph had as a young boy or as a young lad, he overcame any of his weakness and he became a very trusted man in his character and also in his morality as well. When he arrived in Egypt as a slave, Potiphar one of Pharaoh's chief officials uh, bought him as a slave. Joseph immediately advanced in a position to where he was trusted with great responsibilities. His trouble began when Potiphar's wife tried to entice him into a sexual relationship. Joseph refused to go to bed with her. Later, the wicked man or woman accused Joseph of doing the very thing he consistently refused to do. She accused Joseph of forcing her to go to bed. In this incident, Joseph refused to compromise his moral integrity, and he is probably remembered for that for many, many years to come. But he had yielded to Potiphar's wife's temptation, he probably would have had a whole different life. But because he stood up for the Lord and did what was right, the Lord just kept blessing and blessing and blessing him, as you know the story of Joseph. Joseph stood firm in his convictions and was forced to go to jail, though, but he emerged as also being in charge of the entire jail. He was so trusted. One interesting sideline that could be observed from this, that Potiphar 
probably really didn't believe his wife as far as uh, him going to bed with her. In fact, if he would have really believed that, he probably would have been executed on the spot because they didn't take kindly to adultery back in those days. And so we know that uh, sending him to jail was probably an act of mercy on Potiphar's behalf. Let's look at several little interesting facts about purity as we read through Genesis 39. Number one point that I see in Joseph's life is you can't keep a good man down. Point number one. Now, can anybody tell me another person in the Bible that you might think this could be true of? Now, think a little while. It's a little play on words, but I think it goes. Joseph. Or, excuse me, Jonah. Jonah, remember? Okay, well, I know what it is. A little sideline joke, anyway. But anyway. You're still thinking on that one. <laughs> Joseph performed his task well in Potiphar's household. We don't know exactly how long Joseph worked for Potiphar before he was recognized as a man of responsibility, but the text shows us that he was soon promoted. We read from the time he, uh, that uh, Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he put him in charge of everything in his house. And the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. So Potiphar left Joseph uh, in charge of everything in his house. Let's read Genesis 39, 5 and 6. So Potiphar left in Joseph's care everything he had with Joseph in char charge. He did not concern himself with any thing except the food that he ate. Joseph was not boasting, but simply stating a fact when he told Potiphar's wife, no one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, talking to his wife in verse 9. God's blessing was on Potiphar's household but we can be sure part of the reason that he was in charge and how Potiphar's household was blessed was that Joseph was a good administrator. And God was blessing Joseph because he cooperated with his purposes. George Will wrote this little essay on men at work. And I, I kind of like this. Baseball umpires, as you know, are carved with granite. They are professional dispensers of pure justice. Once when Babe Pinelli called Babe Ruth out on strikes, Ruth made a populist argument. Ruth realized maliciously, as populists do, from raw numbers to moral weight, and shouted to the umpire, this is what he said to the umpire. There's 40,000 people here in the stadium, and you and they know that it was a ball. And then he called the umpire a tomato head. Well, umpire Pinelli replied, maybe so, but mine is the only opinion that counts. The morality of the world is against the moral laws of God in our society. But we'd better listen to God, for on the final judgment, His is the only opinion that counts. Think about that. Point number two. Sin of any kind is against God. When Potiphar's wife insisted that Joseph yield to her advances, Joseph said to her, and I think this is the most important part of this scripture, and deals with morality in itself. This is what he said. How could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Verse 5. That is the key scripture to morality in our today's society. And we should have that same morality as we go through life when we think about sin. How could I do such a, a wicked thing and sin against my God? Joseph 
response indicates that he thought first in terms of his relationship with God. And we need to do the very same thing when we are tempted to sin. We must think in first terms of our relationship and how this sin that I am tempted to will hurt that very precious relationship that I have with God. He knew that taking another man's wife would have dire consequences, but his first most concern was his obedience to God and God's moral laws. Notice as you look at this particular passage of Scripture, when Potiphar's wife made advances and grabbed his cloak, what does it say? He literally ran. <laughs> he was smart. He knew that he didn't want to hang around and be tempted by Potiphar's wife. He literally ran from his temptation. And so often when we know that we're tempted to sin, sometimes we kind of like to play around with it and see how close we can come to not sinning, and so therefore, you know, if we if you play with fire enough, eventually you're going to get burned. I, I don't just probably going to fail. Right. Now, we know that that's going to be true, and so that's why he literally ran. And we have to realize that all sin is against God. When we mistreat, uh, mistreat another person, we mistreat one of God's special creation. When we abuse our bodies through sin, we have to realize that we are abusing the very temple of God. And we are, our bodies are the temple of God. So-called sins against society are first of all sins against our Lord. Second of all, third of all, personal purity is essential for successful living. Let me say it again. Personal purity is essential for successful living. No other sin will mar the lives of our young people and stifle their chance of happiness in the future is when they are sexually immoral. When young people lose or cross the line of physical indulgence, and allow themselves to become impure, something happens to their life. Things are never the same. There's a show on TV. I don't know if you've ever seen it or not. I haven't watched it long. But it, it's called Pregnant at 16. Um, I don't know too much about the show. I wasn't really captivated by that. But it does show a lot of the difficulties that a 16-year-old goes through when she becomes permissive at a, such a young age, they carry with them crippling consequences of their actions uh, for mess a lot of the time. Not that that can't be overcome, but it's still a big mistake to become pregnant and a, a sin to become pregnant at 16. More than a century ago, a man led a young woman to a passionate affair. As a result, she became weaker and proceeded from one promiscuous experience to another, ultimately destroying her happiness and self-worth. Later, that man that uh, had this affair with this young woman, um, he was later called to preach the Word of God. In other words, to become a preacher. He carried with him the memory of what he had done to the young woman. He could not resist until he searched and he found her. He pleaded with a broken heart for him to be forgiven by her and sought to help her to find Christ and uh, have a new life. But unfortunately, she was very weak and unable to repent of what she had done. The man carried a broken heart to his grave. Sin has become a way of life to so many people. Nowadays, they're not ashamed of it. They brag about it. When David, as you know, committed adultery with Bathsheba, he pleaded in great guilt in Psalms 51. This is what he said in Psalms 51, 14. Against you, God, and only you have I sinned 
and done what is evil in your sight. In other words, he felt really bad about what he had done. He even eventually committed murder against her husband, Uriah, and put him at the very front of the army. And he carried with him this guilt the rest of her life. Even though God forgave him, and he was called a man after God's own heart, it was still something that he regretted for the rest of his life. Even before the law was given, God has placed within us a sense of responsibility in your heart. Why do you think we are not made in the image of God? We are made in the image of God, and therefore there is guilt, or at least should be guilt, when sin arises. But the big difference between a Christian and a non-Christian is, when we have Christian sin, we feel a sense of tremendous guilt given to us by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to be talking about the Holy Spirit next week and how He plays such a significant role in our lives. When we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from, I like this, all unrighteousness. Isn't that a great scripture? We, if, if all we have to do is be sorry and confess, and as Christians, He'll forgive all of our sins. He'll wipe the, the slate clean and then we not, do not have to feel guilt any longer. We praise the Lord for 1 John 1, 9. Sin is sin, and we must not take it lightly. I like this illustration of how sin can destroy us. It's taken from the view from a zoo uh, by Gary Richmond, a former zookeeper. This is what he said. How many people uh, see quite a few raccoons around the area. Now, we live by the Iowa River, so there's a lot of raccoons, so you'll be able to illustrate, be able to identify with this illustration about the raccoon. Raccoons go through a glandular change at 24 months. Now, I don't know if you knew that or not, but anyway, I'm telling you. After that, they often attack their owners. Since a 30-pound raccoon can be equal to a 100-pound dog in a scrap, this man felt compelled to tell little Julie about her pet raccoon and what it could do it after 24 months. <laughs> Julie insisted politely, and she said, it will be different for me, and she smiled, bandit my pet raccoon will never hurt me. He just wouldn't. Well, three months later, Julie went, underwent plastic surgery for a facial laceration sustained by her so-called pet raccoon called Bandit. And then Bandit was released into the wild, of course, after this particular event. I think we can relate this to sin. Sin, too, comes addressed in an adorable disguise. And as we play with it, how easy it is to say, sin will be different for me. Sin will not affect me whatsoever. But as you know, we don't call the devil the prince of the world for nothing. He's very sly, he's very subtle, and eventually he can get sin to destroy you in a tremendous way as we've seen time after time after time. And you know for yourself that you have to be very careful about sin because it is very addictive and it can be pleasurable. If I can't stand enough up here and say, sin is not fun, that's why it's so attractive. But it's sin only for a short time and then we pay and pay and pay some more. In the movie, Courageous. I don't know how many have seen the movie Courageous. There are a few that have seen the movie Courageous. It so happens that a father was very concerned about his young, beautiful teenage daughter and about her purity. So they had a very special day, father and daughter, in which he gave her a very expensive ring. And this time, if we can get that clip on, we'll show that at this particular time. 
And uh, you might turn the lights up too. We'll see how this goes here. Hopefully we'll get it. As you notice, she could only wear that ring if she promised to be sexually pure until her wedding day. It was a very touching part of that particular movie. It showed the love of her father toward her daughter, and as you saw in the little clip here, tears were flowing from the teenage daughter. And at, later that night, she was laying in bed just looking at her ring and just really just praising her father for being that concerned and that lovely about her personal purity. It was so happens that the promise rings were very popular uh, of quite a few years ago in which uh, girls would wear rings like the one that you just seen. Did they promise that through their teenage years and following that they would be sexually pure. Now that's not true in today's society. It seems like nowadays that the young couples are um, sometimes jumping in bed as early as the first and second day. We need to go back to God's laws. We need to keep ourselves pure. And if we do, just like Joseph, he will bless our lives to the place we cannot believe. Purity is the most precious thing given to us by God. When one compromises purity and sanctity, well then you will so easily compromise other areas in your life. 1 Timothy 5.22, and I'm going to close with this. Paul said it simply, to the point, keep yourself pure. Today, if you would like to be completely pure, 
we are in, extending an invitation to you in which uh, you can come and be baptized in Christ Jesus. And it says that you'll be white as snow. White as snow. That's how much the Lord loves you. He wants you to keep pure. And when you do mess up, praise the Lord for 1 John 1, 9. We need to be sorry for our sins. Bring that sin to God, and we will be pure as the day that we were baptized. 